Hello class, this is Ms. Augustine, and today we're going to begin talking about Chapter 5, which is about the periodic law. So let's do a little history of the periodic table. Dmitri Mendeleev was the first person to organize the elements into a chart back in 1869. And he organized about 70 elements that were known at that time, and he organized them according to increasing atomic mass. And he left blank spaces for elements that he knew had not yet been discovered. So here is Dmitry Mendeleev, and here is his periodic table. You will notice it is written in Russian, because that's what he was. And you'll see that there are blank areas here where he left room for elements that had yet to be discovered. Um, and not much changed on the periodic table until 1911, where this fellow, Henry Mosley, who worked in uh, Rutherford's laboratory, rearranged Mendeleev's periodic table to its current configuration, which means he arranged it in order of increasing atomic number instead. And he also grouped elements according to their properties. So what is periodic law? Periodic law states that when the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, there is a periodic repetition of their physical and chemical properties. Spoiler alert, know this definition. It will show up on tests. So this is why it's called the periodic table, because there is a periodic repetition of both physical and chemical properties. So here's a picture of the modern periodic table, and you'll see you've got your alkaline metals, alkaline earths. These purple ones are transition. These down here are the so-called inner transitions. They scooch in right here between lanthanum and hafnium and actinium and rutherfordium. And then over here, there is a line of demarcation. This line of demarcation separates metals from nonmetals. Everything to the left of that line of demarcation is a metal, and everything to the right is a nonmetal, with the exception of hydrogen. Hydrogen is kind of a weirdo. So according to the modern periodic table, the arrangement is periods, the horizontal rows. There are seven. And the properties change as you move from left to right across a period. And every time you start a new row, the properties begin to repeat again. So the periods are the rows. And elements range roughly from 1 to 118 at this point, atomic number. And then the groups are the vertical columns and also sometimes known as families. The elements in a group have similar physical and chemical properties. Each group has both a letter and a number, depending on which one you pick up. Some will have 1a through 8a, and then they'll have 1 through 10b, and so forth. Um, the periodic table that we will be using uses the modern numbering system, which is groups 1 through 18 as you go from left to right across the table. So the groups are the vertical um, columns, and the group A elements are the rainbow ones, and those are here, and then the transition elements are the gray, and this one doesn't show the inner transitions, but they're there as well. So the main group elements are divided into three groups, metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. So I'll take them one at a time. Metals have high electrical conductivity. They have high luster. That means they're shiny. They are ductile. That means that they can be drawn into wires. They are malleable. They can be hammered into shapes. And here are three, represent or three examples of representatives of metals. You've got copper silver, and gold. I thought we'd do some pretty pictures. So going on, the group 1 metals, the alkali metals, react violently with water. They are very reactive, and in fact, you're not going to find alkali metals just hanging out because they are so reactive. They will form compounds, combine to form compounds. The group 2s are the alkaline earths. They're very common in the earth's surface. So here's an example of a group 1 metal, sodium and a group 2 metal, magnesium. 
Groups 3 through 12 are the transition metals, and most of them are the ones that you think about with the very commonly found metals. The lanthanides and actinides are the inner transitions down at the bottom. Groups 13 through 16 are going to either be metals, metalloids, or nonmetals. It depends on the location, um, their location with regard to the line of demarcation. Group 17's halogens are highly reactive. So there's uh, fluorine gas, there's chlorine gas, there's bromine, which is a gas, but it is very willing to become a liquid. And then there's iodine, which is a solid that um, sublimes to a gas very readily. And then group 18, the noble gases, Spoiler alert, they're all gases. They do not react or combine with any other element unless you really beat on them. They are inert. Um, their electron configuration is so stable that they do not react. And then with the nonmetals, these are the non-lustrous elements, generally poor conductors of electricity. They are located in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. And here are three examples, sulfur, phosphorus, and carbon. So the metalloids are elements that border the line between the metals and the nonmetals, and they have properties that are intermediate between metals and nonmetals. So they have properties of both. Examples are silicon and boron. So whenever you hear about semiconductors, those are metalloids. Uh, two notable examples would be silicon and boron shown here. And so this periodic table is showing you the metals, which are everything in green, the nonmetals, which are orange, and the blue are the so-called metalloids. And again, here's another really big periodic table. It has lots of information. So I like to talk briefly about electron configurations and the periodic table. So electron configurations. Each group on the periodic table has the same ending electron configuration. So by group, I mean vertical column. So group 1 elements all end with the S1 configuration, 1S electron. Group 13 elements all end with a P1 configuration. Group 18 elements all end with a P6 configuration. So elements position on the periodic table tells you its electron configuration. Learning to read the periodic table will help you through this year. If you understand how it's set up, then you can figure out whether something's going to react or not because you know its electron configuration. So an element's position on the table tells you its electron configuration. So the group number is going to tell you what the electron configuration is. You're going to know if it's in the S block, the P block, etc. And the row number is going to indicate the highest occupied principal energy level. So you know very much about an element by knowing its electron configuration. So let's look at a periodic table. So here's a block diagram. So now this is going to be breaking up the periodic table into blocks, the S, P, D, and F. So notice over here, the first two columns correspond to the first and second S electron. Then we come over here to this blue region, and you'll see I've labeled it P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6. So the reason that the noble gases are so stable is it turns out that having a full S and P sublevel is extremely stable. And recall that when we're talking about valence electrons, we're talking about S and P electrons. That's really going to tell you a lot about reactivity. And then here in the middle, this is the D block. It goes from D1 through D10. And then down here, the F block goes from F1 through F14. So this final slide, I think I showed you in our chapter four slides, this is showing you the S block. This is where the S's are filling in, and you can see the layering as you add energy levels. Here's our P block, our D block, and our F block. So this is Ms. Augustine, and I'm going to sign off here.